Let's uh, turn to Romans chapter 7 is where we are today. <laughs> Romans chapter 7. You know, a few months back, I started going through the book of Romans, and we went all the way back to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. And we made it all the way through chapter 6, and then I went back and we started doing that series on the church, and we began with identity, and we finished with the purposes of a church. And then we had Christmas and New Year's, and then we had the prodigal son, and now we're back to Romans, so we're back to chapter 7. Before I go into chapter 7, I want to just do a recap of the first six chapters. You might not have been here, you might have missed a couple things, so I'm just going to go over the, the big parts, the big points of the first six chapters to get us where we are this morning. <laughs> See, this book, this Romans, this letter, was, uh, is considered the great letter of theology. <clears throat> it's a statement of what Paul believed. It's a statement of his theology. You see, Paul wasn't writing to the church for a specific problem. He wasn't addressing a specific problem or concern like he does in some of his other letters. He was primarily writing the, the Roman church or the Roman, the church in Rome, to ground them and root them in the Christian faith. He had that purpose. It wasn't just to solve some problems. And in that, he was pretty much free to write what he thought to be the, the basics of the Christian faith, of what he needed. He didn't have to cover the problem. He could just lay it out the way he wanted to lay it out. This uh, book of Romans is also the letter written for everyone. No one really is exempt from this letter. We can't say, well, that really doesn't apply to me. He's not talking to me, things like that. It is written for everyone because it is the gospel of God. It is for everyone. It is the book for the world, it's the book for the church, for theologians, for theologians, theologians, for philosophers, for unbelievers, for believers, for the unchurched, for the church, it's for everyone. It's the truth that we that every man and woman desperately needs. So we, we're not exempt, and, and we even will we'll cover some of that before in, in a little bit. And then it's the letter written to the church. You know, one of the driving forces of Paul is he wanted to get to this church in Rome. He wanted to go visit it, but I think he knew that he probably wasn't going to get to, and he never did. So he wrote this letter to them. And so that's the letter to the church. He was forced to write just in case. Everything he wished he could say to the church, or he would say to the church, if he was ever allowed to go there. And this is what the church needs to hear. If the church only had one book of the Bible to keep or to hold on to, this would be the best one because it covers everything that as a Christian and as a church we need to hear. And that's the reason I chose this book to go through. So the very start, Romans chapter 1, even in verse 1, Paul identifies himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. If you want to flip back with me in 1.1, 1, 1, he identifies himself as a bondservant, a slave to the gospel, a slave to Christ, a bondservant. The first, few chap the first few verses of this chapter talk about, it's basically the greeting and the thinking. He's saying, hey, I'm Paul, I'm a bond servant, and these are the reasons I'm writing to you. He tells us of his interest in the church, and he's so interested in the church because he's heard so much good things about it. And he even um, compliments them, and he says, you know, I've heard all these good things of how you're standing firm in this crazy world because Rome was full of craziness. And this church was standing firm, and he knew it, and he had heard about it. And then we go into like uh, verse, uh, yeah, verse 14 through 16 in chapter 1. We get the three I am's of Paul. He says, uh, I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So Paul claims to be a debtor to people. He, he owes them the gospel, to, per se. We don't, you know, we don't really consider ourselves debtor to many people around here. But Paul knew that he had an obligation to the people. And then he says, uh, I am ready, verse 15. I am ready to preach the gospel. The Bible teaches us that we should be ready in season and out of season to uh, proclaim the gospel and to give an account for the reasons for what we believe. Paul says, I'm ready. And then he goes in, uh, verse 16, I am not ashamed. So he says, I am a debtor. I am ready, and I am not ashamed of the gospel. How many of us are sometimes ashamed of what God, not ashamed, but maybe just scared to tell someone? We know what God's done in our life. We've seen some miraculous healing. He's done some great thing in our life, but we're scared to tell anybody about it because we don't want to think we're crazy or some holy roller or something like that. We just don't, we're, 
We don't tell people. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. He says, I'm not ashamed. If anything, I'm bold in it. He says he's not ashamed, and that's the way we need to be. Well, then in like uh, verses 18 through, uh, I don't know, the third chapter, Paul starts building a case. I think he's like a lawyer in another life, but he, he builds a case against everyone where none of us are exempt. He starts building this case. Excuse me. <clears throat> he starts building this case, and he starts telling us why God shows wrath. He starts off, why does God show wrath? It's because of all the things that we do wrong in verse 18 through 23. And then he says, he shows us how God shows wrath. And how does he show wrath? By just letting you do what you want to do. Some of us think, oh great, that's cool. I get to do what I want to do. But you know, that's the worst thing he can do is just let you do what you want. Because you know where you'll lead yourself? And that's to destruction. So the worst thing he could do, and that's how he shows wrath, is by just turning you over to your own desires. Not only do you, does it lead you to hell on earth, but it leads you to hell eternal. And that's the ultimate wrath of God. And that's how he shows it. He just lets you do what you want to do. And then he continues to build that case against the moralist. And the moralist, moralist the problem with the moralist, that's the one that you know thinks right and does right. The problem with the moralist is they judge people. And he says we shouldn't be judging. Only God can judge. And, and he gives us the verse that there's no partiality with God. So even as moralists, even as right, righteous, self-righteous people, there's a problem. It's because we end up judging other people. And then he builds a case against the religionist. Or back then as the Jew. This is the, this is the holy roller. This is the uh, mechanical mind. The holy Joe. Or whatever you want to call them. They go to all the church things. They do all the stuff they're supposed to do. The religionist. I do all the ceremonies. I do everything I'm supposed to do. He builds a case against them. And he shows that that's just a salvation or an attempt to salvation by works and not by faith. And then he shows us the difference in a, a heart religion and a, and a works. And then at the end of uh, chapter 3, towards the end, he starts building a case against all people. So if you have your Bibles, you want to turn over to chapter 3, verse 10. He says, as it is written, He's quoting older uh, scripture. He says, there is none righteous, no, not one. So that pretty much takes care of all of us. So you think, well, I'm not a moralist. I don't judge people. I'm not a religionist. I'm not a, I don't go to church every time it's open. Well, you got you there. No one is righteous, no, not one. He's built a case for everybody. He's built a case against all of us. And if I left you right there, that wouldn't be very good news. I think I even ended a sermon right there. And I said, well, hang on. Next week it gets better. And that's what happens at the end. Uh, chapter 3, verse 21, he, he switches. And then we get to the famous verse uh, 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But in 24, he says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So he says, we've all sinned, but we can be freely justified by his grace. He, he starts giving you the answer. He shows, you know, he was showing that the, uh, the world needs to get right with God. And now he's showing the way the world can get right with God. And that's through faith and justification. We've all sinned, but by grace is free. Faith. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, he says that ends boasting. When we put our faith in what Christ did and not what we did, it takes all the pride and boasting. We can't say, well, look what I did. We have to say, look what Christ did. It takes away that. There's no room for that. He goes into talking about rituals and ordinances and ceremonies in the wrong way for us to seek justification. And that the law will not justify us. He keeps going and he uses Abraham as, a, as a, an example of a person justified by faith alone. And Abraham wasn't justified by works, but by faith, by what he did. And then at the uh, chapter 5, it starts off 5.1. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith. This is good stuff right here. Chapter 5 is a great chapter. Therefore, having been justified by faith, it starts to show us God's unbelievable love for us and how much he did for us. The results of justification. You know, justification is justified. Just if I never really messed up. Justified. We're made right. The results 
It says in verse 1, we have peace with God. Somebody say amen, we have peace with God. Amen. amen. I mean, I don't even like when I don't have peace with my neighbor. This is the creator of the universe. And I have peace with him. That's a good thing. So these are the results of justification. What comes out of it? And then he goes into the great depths of it, and starting in verse 6. How far did God go? Well, my favorite verse, 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It talks about while we were without strength, while we were enemies, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that tells me? He didn't wait on me. He didn't wait on me to get cleaned up. He didn't wait on me to get married, to graduate, to make a family, to get a good job, to do this and this and this, to get my life straight before I could come to him. He died while I was still a sinner. He came to me. He made the first move. See, many of us, we put off church things, we put off Christianity, we put off all these things to a later day. Well, if I could just make this happen. If I can just retire, if I didn't have to go to work every day, I can spend more time at the church. I can do more things that I want to do. And when my kids get grown, or when I have kids, I'll get them into church. And I'll, you see, we're just always putting it off. Christ did not put himself off. He did it while we were still sinners. And that's unbelievable. Death of justification, his love for us. And then in, he goes on and compare Adam and Christ. Uh, verse 19 Five nineteen is where I'm at. Uh, he says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So he compares Adam and Christ. Remember Adam? He's the guy that ate the apple, you know, that the wife gave him. <laughs> That's what he said. Actually, he said, uh, the woman that you gave me, give me that. He blamed God. He wasn't blaming the woman. He ended up blaming God because he said, God, you gave me the woman and she gave me the apple. <laughs> but through that act, sin entered the world. And, and Paul is saying through that act, sin entered the world, but through the act of Christ, it was made right. And he shows those two focal points of history. And he keeps going. And in the chapter 6, so we're, we're, he shows you the way we become justified. But then he says, God doesn't want to leave you that way. Once we become justified, we're still fighting. We're still putting up with all the stuff that we weren't. You know, when you accept Christ, you're, you're, you have this new identity, but you're still living in this world, and you're still fighting the same old stuff. And he, he starts to teach us the way we become free from sin and how we don't have to worry about it anymore. And uh, he doesn't want us to continue in sin. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because he's preaching this free grace and, and it covers all sin. So he's saying, so what do we, we can, means we can do anything we want. And the more we sin, the more grace abounds, right? Right? He says, certainly not. We don't have a license to sin. That's not why we're here. Uh, he, he tells us we need to know some things. He says we need to know our position in Christ. We need to remember that position. We need to live out our position in Christ. And then he ends chapter 6 says, we do not have a license to sin. And he's reminding us that. He doesn't give us a license. We can't go out on Saturday night and say, well, I can go to church on Sunday and he'll forgive me. That's not how it works. There's no guarantees you'll make it to church on Sunday morning, I can tell you that. But that's not how we should treat it. Treat his grace. That's just taking advantage of it. So here we are, chapter 7, verse 1. We are uh, turning, the, turning the tides just a little bit. So he, he wants us to be free from sin, but he also knows that we still struggle with this. There's still struggles, and this is chapter 7, um, I think it's 1 through 25, which is the whole chapter. Uh, he, he starts talking about the struggle. And this is where we get the famous verses of Paul saying, I do the stuff that I don't want to do, and I don't do the stuff that I do, but I know I'm supposed to do. So even Paul is struggling with this stuff, with, with this this flesh, this body, and we'll talk about. That doesn't give us the excuse, well, Paul couldn't figure it out. No, he's just being honest, and that should give us hope and encouragement that we're not the only one that still struggles with living a Christian life, following Jesus in a broken world. It's still We still live in this world, and it's this side of heaven, we're going to have these problems. So starting off, 1 through 6 is where we are this morning, chapter 7. 
verses 1 through 6, and I'm going to read them here for us. He says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is freed from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. He says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, and that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this letter from Paul. Lord, I ask today that you let these, these verses, these scriptures, this passage sink into our heart. And uh, we will understand who, who we're married to. Are we married to the law or are we married to you? And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So my question this morning is, who are you married to? And I know that's kind of a funny title, but, but that's basically what uh, Paul is talking about. See, there's two positions of the law to the believer, or to anybody. There's two positions here. See, the law of God stands before us. You don't have a choice. The law of God exists whether you like it, whether you believe it. It doesn't matter. The law of God is there, and it stands before us. And there's two positions that we must understand as Christians. We must understand if we want to secure peace in this life. So what are we talking about the law? The law is mentioned, when it's mentioned in the Bible, basically it's talking about the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if you go back and read that, there's a lot of laws, a lot of commands, a lot of decrees, a lot of uh, this do and this don't. And if you do this, you got to do this. There's a lot of laws there, all the way down to the simple uh, nitty-gritty type laws to the big laws. And if we had to follow those laws, let me tell you, church, we would be in trouble. We would be in trouble. If you ever want to realize what Christ has done for you, just go back. I mean, you just pick one and read it like, oh, thank you, Lord. Because it's some tough stuff. And they lived a tough life. But that's what that law is talking about. Those first five books, those, those decrees, those commands that God gave us. See, the, the law in verses 1 through 3 talks about the law only dominates us as long as we live. The law only applies to the living. It has no bearing upon the dead. And that's what he's saying. He's saying that the law, verse 1, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. See, there's... The law has nothing to do with a dead person. Right? It's only as we are alive. So I want you to understand these two positions. The law is alive and it's active to the living. And it gives you this kind of a funny example of a husband and a wife. While they are both still alive and while they were both still married, they are bound by the law of marriage and the law of divorce and all the laws that apply to them because they're both still alive. But if the husband dies, she's free from that law. And wives don't get any ideas. I don't need you to join in the Ferguson church. I need you to stay here. While he's still alive, they're bound by the laws of marriage. But when he dies, she's free from the law. And that's what he's trying to do. He's just using that example. When death, when death enters the picture, the, uh, the, she's free from the law. She's free from her husband. She don't have to worry about that anymore. And then in verse 3, so while if her husband lives, she marries another, she'll be called adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's no longer adulteress. See, the law only condemns the living who violates his demands. But when, when we die, we're free from the law. Now, I know you may be thinking, wow, well, that's great. You know, I'll be looking forward to when I die. I won't have, any, uh, won't have to worry about the law anymore. But there is good news. He's just setting us up to show us. When we're alive, we're bound by the law. But when we're dead... We're not bound by the law anymore. So how does this work? How does this, I don't want to wait till I'm dead to figure this out. There's hope. Let's read on. So in verse 4, he says, therefore, what is it therefore? Let's see. Therefore, my brethren, 
you also have become dead to the law. How did I do that? I haven't dead, died yet. He says, through the body of Christ. That's how we become dead to the law, even though we're still alive on this earth. But we have to become dead to that law, because that law can do nothing for us that's any good. So that's what he's saying. We can become dead to the law. This is the first position of the law to the believer. The first position of the law to the believer. Remember I said there's two positions. You're either one or the other. The first one is the law is dead to the believers. The believers are dead to the law. The believers in Jesus Christ. Believers are dead to the law. You don't have to worry about that. They're not bound to. There's no jurisdiction, no power, no rule, no authority, no dominion over the true believer. The law is a dead issue to the believer. It has nothing to do with the believer. Do y'all get the point? That's what he's trying to say. It doesn't apply. It has nothing on you anymore. The believer is dead to the law. The law is dead to the believer. No more guilt, no more shame. All the things that eat us up. You know the devil is a liar? He will remind you of all that stuff. He will remind you of your past. He will remind you of all the things that you've done. And when he starts doing that, just remind him of his future. It has no place over us. No shame, no guilt, no condemnation, no punishment, discouragement, frustration, tension, pressures, sense of failure, sense of unworthiness, sense of disappointment. The law has no application. Well, how can this be? Verse 4. You are dead to the law. How? Through the body of Christ. Through the body of Christ. The believer is dead to the law by the crucified <coughs> body of Christ. The believer is slain or, or put to death in Christ. And this is hard for us to, to get it sometimes. That's where faith steps in. How, how did Jesus' death on that cross save me? I didn't get up on that cross. How does that work? And that's where we get caught up sometimes and we have trouble. That's where faith comes in. See, the believer's death in Christ is, is called a vicarious death. He died for us, in place for us. We didn't physically have to do it. He did it. He did it in our place. We die spiritually. We die to ourselves. And that's what happens when we put our faith. God counts that. God takes that trust that you tell God, you tell yourself, I count Christ's death. He takes that and he counts you as righteousness. And that's how it works. I don't know why he did it. I guess he just loves us a whole lot. He gave us that opportunity. But that's what happens. Therefore, the believers, we are dead to the law, being dead in Christ. We're freed from the law, from its demands. It doesn't apply to us anymore. The punishment. Just like in verse 3, when her husband dies, she's free. She can go do what she wants, right? No. She's free from that. She's free from that demand and law of her husband. The, the believer is freed by the body of Christ, his slain body, by his blood. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Remember the prodigal son in a far off land? You can be in a far off and be sitting in this room today. You can be far off. And he's saying the blood of Christ has brought those that are far off and brought them near to God by the blood of Christ. By his flesh. Two verses later, Ephesians chapter 2, 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of the commandments, contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace it says his body gets rid of that enmity between us and God and by, his, by the cross so by his blood, by his flesh, by the cross Ephesians 2, 16 and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross thereby putting to death the enmity so that's how it works. By his blood, his body, the cross. He put that law to death for us. You see, Christ bore those sins, our sins on that cross. His suffering satisfied the justice. His death made us acceptable to God and deliver us from the penalty of the law. And that's the basis of the Christian faith. And you have to believe that. 
You have to accept it. You may say, well, I can't accept that. I, that doesn't work for me. But that's, it's, it's simple. It's a simple concept, but hard to sometimes get a grasp on. But that's all it is. Christ died for me. The question is, when you get to heaven and you're knocking on the pearly gates, you know all the jokes. You get to heaven and you're knocking on the pearly gates and it's like, let me in. And Peter says, why should I let you in? What are you going to say? Are you going to say, well, I did all this good stuff? <laughs> you answer. You say, because Christ died for me and I put my faith in his right. Oh, that secret password. Come on. That's it. It's simple. Not all the stuff you did. You can't do enough stuff. The Bible says all our works are like filthy rags. Nothing but the blood of Christ. Now there's a purpose to this. You know, the woman, the husband died, the woman's free, right? She gets to free, she gets to be partying and marrying whoever she wants now, right? It's free. No, that's not our purpose. Christ doesn't free us from the law, so we can go do all the stuff we want to do. There's a purpose. We're still in verse 4. There's a lot in verse 4. It says, we become dead to the law through the body of Christ. And then why? That you may be married to another, and that's Jesus Christ. He frees us from the law so we can be joined to him. That's what he does. There's the purpose. Not just for your freedom to do what you want. The believer dies to the law so that we can be united to Christ, the risen and living Lord. That's why he does it. The picture of marriage is used again. Before coming to Christ, we're married to the law, and now we're married to Christ. It's a whole lot better marriage, let me tell you. An active marriage, a living marriage, not one of them old dead marriages like when you're married to the law. But in a live marriage, we get to be married to another, to him, not just anyone else, but to Jesus Christ. Now the believer is not only dead to the law, united in Christ, but there's another purpose. It says, uh, to him who was raised from the dead, the last part of verse 4, it says, to bear fruit to God. So to be united with him, and then to bear fruit to God. And what fruit are we talking about? Apples and oranges, what, what kind of fruit? The Bible is clear about what fruit, what Christians or what people of faith should have fruit in their life. James is very hard on us without, without some kind of evidence. You better start questioning your faith. That's what he says. There has to be an evidence. These are the fruits. Romans 6.21. I'm just going to, well, it's on the same page as my Bible. 6.21. He says, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? What fruit was that that you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And then even in Romans 1.13, he talks about the fruit of converts. Back to the beginning when he says, Now I do not want you to be unaware that I often plan to come, that I might have some fruit among you. Converts. So he wants us to, to bear this fruit. That's our purpose, to bear fruit of Christian character, the fruit of the Spirit. Y'all know that? You know that song? Love, joy, peace. I have to use my notes. Patience, kindness, goodness, <laughs> faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I think there's nine of them, right? That's a little song maybe I'll like teach it to you one day. Those are the fruits. There must be something there. That's the purpose. He didn't set you free from the law to do your own thing. He set you free from the law to be united with Christ. And why are you united with Christ? Is to bear fruit for him. That's our purpose. We should be bearing fruit. Sometimes I think we need to be fruit inspectors. We need to be looking at our fruit. And even when you go to the store and you're looking at fruit, do you just take it or do you pick it up and you look at it all the way around? Because you know what the stores do? The guy that does the stock and he goes around and he turns all the bad stuff in the back. <laughs> he turns the dinner cans backwards. <laughs> you got to pick it up and you got to look at it all the way around. Just because it's sitting on the shelf all pretty doesn't mean anything. Pick it up. What's my fruit? Look at it. Examine it. Be a fruit inspector. So that's our purpose. So that's the first position that Paul talks about is we are dead to the law. The believers are dead to the law and the the law is dead to the believers. Let's look at the second. Verse 5. He takes us back. He says, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. There's a lot more stuff in there. The second position. The law is still alive to those that are in the flesh. 
Now, what does it mean to be in the flesh? A person is in the flesh. That's the natural person. That's the unbeliever, the person without Christ, the unsaved, the unjustified, the unrepentant. The natural person is in the flesh. The flesh is corruptible. It's tainable. It's debased, ruined, depraved by sin. <coughs> That's why it only lives a few years on earth. Sin destroys the body, the natural flesh. The Bible says this about flesh. Flesh has no good thing about it. Well, that's not very nice, Pastor. What the Bible says, there's nothing good about our natural self. There's nothing good about the flesh. There's no good thing in it. It is opposed to doing good. It wants to do opposite. The person who has the spirit of Christ is removed from being under the influence of that flesh. We're transformed. The Bible says we are a new creation. That's why we have to be a new creation. We can't be the same old Chris. I can't be the same old person and be new in Christ. I can't do it. I can't be the same. I can't have my old identity. But we're in the flesh. We're still under the influence of the flesh. However, the transformed, we can still walk after the flesh. Have you ever heard the word carnal Christian? We can be believers, churchgoers, and all this stuff, but we're still following the worldly things. It's like the, the, the parable of the seed and the sower. How some of the seed hits and the birds immediately take it. And some gets in the ground a little bit and the sun comes out and wipes it out. And then some grows a little bit more and then the thorns choke it out. The carnal Christian. I mean, you can hear stories after stories about people going down the wrong path and you think they're Christian. And they may be, but they're still under the influence of the world. And that's terrible. That's in the flesh, still under the law. The law is alive and active to the one without Christ. So much that this verse says, it says it points out. It points out sin. Law points out sin. It says, look what you did. Look what you did that's wrong. And it starts condemning you. It points it out. And not only does it point it out, it makes you want to do it more. I think I used the example of a stop sign one time. We got the DPS officer in here. Remember? I said, that stop sign's begging to be run. Remember? <laughs> Those fences are begging to be jumped. I got two dogs. I can't keep them in the backyard for nothing. I'll throw rocks in the hole and they'll dig right next to it. I just open the gate. See you. Whatever. <laughs> you want to live here, you'll come back. It's the way God does us. Because as soon as we put up that fence, we want to be digging under it. We want to be jumping it. That's what the law does. It's almost like the law says, this is bad, and that don't do anything but make you want to do it. It creates an interest, the forbidden. We know this. We, if we think back, we'll think back to the uh, things that we, we know are right. just kind of makes us want to do it a little bit more. That's what it does. It can't save us. It only leads us to hell. Now, not only is the law active and alive to the one in Christ, then there's the result of fighting and combating this law. Just like the fruit of the Spirit, the fruits of God, there's the fruit of sin. And that's what he says. This, these passions were aroused by the law and work in our members to bear fruit to death. And that's the fruit that, that delivers. In James 1.15, he says, When sin is full grown, it brings forth death. Same thing. There's no happy ending. There's no, and they live happily ever after to that. When sin is full grown, it brings forth death. And then we get to the, we get to the verse six. The breath of fresh air. He says, "But now, thank you, Lord. Something else. But, but now, we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter." See, the law is inactivated by conversion. The law has no more. It doesn't matter. It's inactivated. Our death in Christ frees us from that law. And that's what he's reminding us of. And he says the oldness of the letter. That's talking about that old law, that old spirit. That old spirit. The Old Testament. And they went by every little letter. They worried about it so much, they even made new laws to keep them from breaking that law. It's called hedges. It's like, well, I'm not supposed to do this on Sunday. There's a laws about what you can and can't do on the Sabbath. So then they built the law outside of that so they wouldn't even get to that law. It just was crazy. And he said, that's the old letter. 
we shouldn't serve, but in the newness of the Spirit. This can refer to the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of truth or the Spirit of Jesus. It can be all kinds of stuff, but it's the one who brings new life to us. And that's it. The new life. The new creation. The believer's new spirit is focused upon God, not on the law. They're focused on their relationship with God, not on all the stuff that I'm not doing right or wrong. I'm focused on God. The Bible tells us if you focus on God, all the things will take care of themselves. Things. Just focus on God. And that's what he says. Focus on the newness of spirit. Serve that newness of spirit. We seek to serve God. And we should know that if we fail, God will forgive you. And he'll allow you to get up and continue on. It's not a one and for all. You get one shot and you're done. He will continue to and he'll lift you up when we fail when we fail. That's freedom. Freedom from the law. The believer no longer serves God in a legal or like a slave. Doomed to discouragement. Doomed to failure. We don't serve that way. We serve a new spirit and freedom. My music guys. So my question I asked you at the beginning this morning, my question is still for you this morning, is who are you married to? And I'm not talking about your wife or husband sitting next to you. Don't be looking at them crazy. But who are you married to? See, there's another way to look at this passage, and you could call it the two marriages. The law and us. The two marriages. Who are you married to? Are you married to that old law? Are you bound to that old law? Are you divorced from that law and married to Christ? Are you dead to that law and married to Christ? My other question is, are you still living in the flesh? Are you still letting this world get a hold of you, influence you? Are you letting the birds come and, and eat the seeds before they even hit the ground? Are you letting the sun come out and scorch it tomorrow? Are you letting the thorns come out and take it out of you next week? Are you still living with that? Are we still being influenced? Or have you truly died to yourself? And that's all it says. Die to yourself. Deny yourself. Not deny yourself something. You know the keto diet? Deny yourself carbs. That's not what it says. Deny yourself ice cream. It doesn't say that. It says deny yourself. That's a lot. Who you are. And follow Christ. Have you denied yourself? Have you been born again? Are you united with Christ? Are you bearing fruit? Are you following the Holy Spirit? That's my question this morning. If you are here this morning and you do not have that relationship with Jesus Christ, I would love to introduce you to him. I'll be down front while they sing the invitation song. If you're interested in joining the church, now would be a time to come down and I'll present you as a new member of the church. If you need prayer for something, I'd love to pray for you. Or you can sit right in your chair or Stand there and listen to the music and pray to God. This is your time to do business with God. There's nothing special about this area. Amen. Will y'all please stand?